Today, I am very excited to uh, introduce Dr. Fidel Valea. Um, Dr. Valea was born in Havana, Cuba and raised in New York City, um, where he earned a BS in biomedical engineering from Columbia um, University uh, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He then went on to medical school at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and then residency in obstetrics and gynecology as well as fellowship in GYN oncology at UNC Chapel Hill. He then joined the faculty at Stony Brook and became the residency uh, program director, PI for the GOG, as well as uh, the director of the division of gynecologic oncology. Um, I brought some. Uh, we'll just pause I here. So no, hold on, Laura. Yeah. I, I get I'm, really you, but I, I'm listening to my uh, meeting. Let's mute you guys. Everybody's got to mute. I make that mistake all the time. I'm either talking on mute, you know, whatever. All right. Um, he then went on to join the faculty at Duke. Um, and at Duke was promoted to full uh, professor with tenure, um, serves as vice chair of uh, education, the residency program director for obstetrics and gynecology, as well as the fellowship director for GYN oncology, um, where uh, after he then was appointed the chair of obstetrics and gynecology at Virginia Tech, um, Carilion School of Medicine. Um, he is a member of many organizations, um, the Society for Gynecologic Oncology, um, ACOG, um, as well as uh, serving on the board of directors of the Association for Professors in Gynecolo Gynecology and Obstetrics. Um, he's currently the director of uh, gynecologic oncology for the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and also serves on the board of directors for ABOG. He has numerous um, uh, teaching awards, national teaching awards, um, over 100 publications, um, and is one of the four editors for the recent edition of Comprehensive Gynecology. His research interests are in pre-invasive disease of the cervix, as well as minimally invasive surgery and evidence-based perioperative care. And his professional passion, as you can probably tell, um, is in med medical education. Um, and one of his closest friends is the honey badger from the University of Wisconsin. So welcome today, uh, Dr. Valea. Wow, thank you. That was uh, not necessary, but I appreciate it. And the, the honey badger has been a long st standing friend of mine. And you should see the version of the honey badger that I got to know because she's been refined since she, she, she uh, left UVA and went to Wisconsin. Can you guys see my slides there? Yeah, you just stop that right now. I, I am, I'm gonna stop. Anything more. <laughs> can you see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Perfect, all right. So I'm gonna talk today about something that it, it's really nerdy, nervy of me to talk about because we all live this and we're still living it. But just to summarize the effects of the pandemic on medical education is what I'd like to do. I, I don't know if that number is accurate. I don't think it is, so ignore that. Um, I gotta tell you about my disclosures. I, I work for ABOG as well, and I'm on the board of directors of ACOG. Well, that's free. Um, I don't get paid for that. I'm the editor of Comprehensive Gynecology, one of them, and I'm also uh, an author for the debate. The last two are really not pertinent to this discussion. The first two are, and I really want you to know that I care deeply about the organizations that I serve, and I would never want to in any way misrepresent them. So what I'm gonna talk about today are my opinions. They don't represent any of the organizations that I serve. They may agree with me, but this is not representing them. So I wanna talk about the pandemic and just outline the events that led us here. Um, list the immediate effects of the pandemic on medical education, and then look at the downstream effects of the pandemic on medical education, and perhaps talk about some potential things we can do to help address some of the needs that the pandemic has created. So in our lifetime, um, these are really defining events. 9-11, and I can tell you exactly where I was. I was at Winthrop Hospital on Long Island talking to Manny Penalver about, I don't remember what we're talking about, and he said, Fidelito, there's some crazy pilot that ran into the World Trade Center. And I was like, oh my God, that was 9-11 for me. And we had almost 3,000 deaths. 
The Iraqi war that spanned eight years, we had a little over 4,000 deaths. COVID-19, and one of the reasons I had to wait to get you my slides, I wanted to be accurate here. And, you know, to the best that I can tell, depending on, and this was numbers from last week, we have over a half a million deaths in the United States. The last number I got was 565,000. You know, when you compare that to the Spanish flu, which, you know, had 675,000 deaths in, in 1918, we're probably going to surpass that, uh, I, I'm, I'm sad to say. But just to give you an idea of the of the, the, the magnitude of what this is for us. So the timeline, you know, the first case in China was December 1st of 2019. The first case outside of China was the Thailand uh, exposure in January of uh, 2020. And then in January 20th, we had our first confirmed case in the U.S. in a nursing home in Seattle. You know, on February 24th, the stock market started to, to, to tumble, it started to get very personal now. On the 13th of March, the WHO declared this a pandemic. And I remember on St. Patrick's Day, I got the, the notice from my leadership at Carillion, we got to shut down. I was like, shut down what? Shut down. You mean like, clo like close everything? I, I mean, I never thought we'd ever get to something like this in my life. So around March of, of uh, March 24th, this is what the scene looked like in New York. You know, the uh, the the group in the Northeast, they were they were drowning. My colleagues in New York, they were right in the midst of it. I was sort of protected. I would assume you guys were to a certain degree as well in the more rural parts of America. So in Southwest Virginia, all I could do is see what these people are going through. Um, but I really wasn't uh, living it. But I can tell you that right around that time, we started to have uh, weekly calls from the Council of University Chairs. So this is a group called KUKOG that Laurel is a, an officer in, it was, and is has been very active this year during the pandemic. They really, really stepped up the call for duty here, and they created weekly calls where I can tell you there were probably 200 people on the call, mostly chairs from across the country, to go over what's going on in New York, New York hospitals now stopped all elective procedures. That sounds like craziness. Stop all elective procedures? I mean, remember, at the beginning, this was sort of like a joke. Come on, you don't mean all of them. But yes. And and in New York, the faculty were starting to get deployed and not working in OBGYN worlds, but working in frontline worlds, like in emergency rooms and in ICUs and triage areas. So we had a major shortage of PPE beds and ventilators, and there was significant fear, not only for the patients, but for us as providers, fears that we were really going to get sick. And Kukog really did a great job of just, just putting the chairs across the country together so that we can, as a group, make plans. And the consensus at this time, right at the beginning of March was, number one, as a chair, you have to communicate clearly and frequently. And at the beginning, it was multiple huddles a day, multiple, you know, I couldn't get information out there quick enough because it was forever changing. What I said in the morning didn't really hold for us in the afternoon and I had to go back out and, 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 and make another statement. We had to create a PPE and testing strategy that was really based on local availability. So my availability here in Roanoke is very, very different than what was going on in New York. And I would bet very different than what was going on in Madison, Wisconsin. And so each of our plans were unique to our organization. And we were incredibly limited in PPE and incredibly limited in testing abilities. So we were really just ducks on a pond there with, with no way to protect ourselves. So our strategies were not the most popular strategies because they didn't easily protect our um, our workforce as, as well as it appeared that the workforces in New York were being protected. We had to plan for more beds. We had to start to figure out contingency plans if we're going to create beds in auditoriums and parking lots. And the other note that came out of the chair's meeting, and this was really, really important, is that as chairs, we had to make sure that we did not forget to focus on provider well-being, which was being incredibly taxed during these times. This is what the last pandemic looked like in 1918. My God, wouldn't we have been so much better if we did this all from the start 
and and we'd probably be done with this thing already if we just did what they did in 1918 when that happened and everybody had to wear a mask or go to jail. Imagine that. So it was sometime in mid-March that it really became personal because up until now, I'm on these Kukag weekly calls and it's all happening in New York and some in Seattle, but it wasn't happening here. Well, when the stock market started to go, go, go down, boy, that really started to hit home. And then I started hearing about mandatory PTO and then furloughs. And I had to go figure out what exactly a furlough was. I sort of had an idea, but I had to fully understand it basically is you're getting a leave from work without pay, but you can come back when your furlough is over. We, we took salary cuts. Um, you know, we were genuinely concerned about our own health, let alone the health of our patients. Remember back at when the pandemic started, they were quoting us about a 10% mortality. It's not quite that high, but it's not low. Um, so we were afraid. And then you really hit home when you started to cancel all sorts of professional events. March Madness was canceled. The NBA seasons were canceled. Professional baseball was put on hold. And then there was no travel. There were no live meetings. You know, our economy came to a screeching halt. So that was the tone. And no surprise that all those things that I thought were affecting others and not us, well, you know what? I was wrong. It affected us. It became personal now. And so I'd like to talk now, the rest of this time, focus on the effects of this pandemic on undergraduate, graduate, and then postgraduate, or what we call continuing medical education. So about mid-March, certainly here at Carillion, the students were pulled from classes and clinical duties. Remember, this is because of the double AMC statement that really encouraged all schools to protect the students. So most of this was to protect them. But because of the pandemic, there was a secondary reason, and that was really to limit spread and limit exposure. You know, the only other, not pandemic, but the other epidemic that I lived through was the HIV epidemic, and I was a medical student then. And man, it was very different then. As students, you were frontline. Well, a patient had HIV, full-blown AIDS, Kaposi sarcoma, pneumocystis pneumonia, you were there, you know? I remember with my brand new stethoscope, I go in, examine the patient, I go out and clean it all and make sure it's sterilized. And my God, very, very different. Students were pulled from the pandemic. They were not part of this. So we had to very quickly figure out how to e-learn. And we learned this as the plane was up in the air. So we had to learn this on the fly. At the same time, we still had patients to take care of. And we had to figure out how to do telehealth and then how to do telehealth with a learner, a resident, a fellow, a medical student. Let me tell you, that was challenging. So within days, we shifted everything to virtual. The students took on different roles, certainly here. I would assume it happened at, at Wisconsin and other institutions across the country as well. But they actually here at Carillion served more like ambassadors for COVID-19 facts that they would then disseminate to the community because there was so much misinformation around that time. Um, certainly with, with the election in it not far away, the amount of information that was out there was very, very confusing. And we used our students and many did across the country uh, to, to provide accurate information. They actually did a lot of the quote unquote scut work, the reviews and gather information. This is education to present to the clinical teams. Here, they worked on public service announcements for, for the diverse communities. We then collect, created electives. So you should know that I have a nephew who lives with me who's in medical school here at Virginia Tech Carillion. He's a fourth year student this year. And um, I watched what happened to him and they put him on this COVID elective. Well, what is that? You know, he learned how to do contract tracing. I have no idea how to do this. How to look at case characterization and create testing platforms and you know, this is a level of system education that these medical students had that I can tell you the Honey Badger and I did not have. And probably most of the people on this call did not have it until that point and had to learn it around that, uh, that time. So th although they lost some in-person education, they did gain a lot on the systems world. So the students were immersed in institutional learning experience and, because this is how they can demonstrate their commitment to lifelong learning. Um, you know, students learn by examples and, and when you have a big group with a big diverse set of skills to solve a problem, they learned how to do things. And so our students were actively 
working on, we need PPE. How do we create PPE? So we leveraged the Virginia Tech School of Engineering, so the undergrad side of our, of our campus, which was incredibly robust. And they got involved in designing with 3D printers and stuff, a new facet of PPE and new types of masks and stuff like that. Because clearly we weren't getting anything from the government, we had to create our own. Students learned to deal with the ethical challenges of not only rationing care to patients, this wasn't as much here as it was rationing the care here in Roanoke of, of PPE and tests to the providers and the patients themselves. We had limited stuff. They had to learn to deal with those ethical issues. In places like New York and the Northwest, the students had to learn and firsthand how to ration care. This patient, we just don't have the, the resources. This patient's gonna die. And those are really, really challenging and very taxing things to, to learn. They learned about new challenges with policy change and clearly some restriction of personal and autonomy. Patients, you know, couldn't come to the office. They were told, no, we have to cancel your, 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 your cases, stay at home, try and do this electronically when, when they didn't want to do that. You know, in reality, what the students did is they learned a new skill set, a skill set that they probably had more developed than people my age had, but still a skill set that we weren't really teaching them in medical school, but we did now. Limited clinical time is a huge challenge for us during the pandemic. With less patients coming to the office for, for care and students not actively involved, they lost months of, of, clinical, uh, of clinical work and clinical learning. Remember, we're experiential learners, whether we like it or not. And when you take away the experience, it affects your education. Telemedicine, certainly at the beginning and certainly in rural America, like Southwest Roanoke, had very limited bandwidth for, for supervision. So initially, they were not even part of our telehealth uh, platform. They are now, and we've created ways for them to do that. So our educators right on the dime had to change and redesign our clerkships and outline priorities to allow students to learn virtually, get some sort of virtual experience and some limited clinical experience to be able to basically say yes, they were able to pass this clerkship. So we had to design different approaches to competency attainment because I'm not gonna witness you doing a history and physical exam on a patient. I could see you do a history and physical exam on a, on a, on a dummy, you know, on a, on a simulation uh, 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 model. It's not quite the same. So schools then had to prioritize learning opportunities for those cl students closest to graduation so fourth year students, if there was any sort of clinical elective, those are the ones that are gonna graduate soonest and they sort of had first dibs on them. Remember, we really had limited options. We, the students were no longer traveling away to do clinical electives. So it was whatever you can find here. That only made our problem worse later because you took all these third year students that are supposed to have clinical learning and gave them none. And the little we had, we gave to the fourth years that were going to graduate. And in New York, they even graduated students earlier because they needed people in the workforce. Um, so just look at how we changed the education for the students. The end result of all this and what I'm really trying to drive at is that we have a backlog of students right now as we sit here. We have two years of learners, third, current third years and current fourth years that have had limited clinical experiences and we now have to try and play catch up. And that is taxing our educational systems because I can tell you that I don't have any more room in the inn to take more students. And there's only so many students you can bring into a case and so many students you can bring into a patient room and really violate the, the, the patient's autonomy. So this is our challenge is now we have two years of students in the workforce education force that we have to dispo. Remember, most schools canceled all the visiting rotations just like we did uh, because it was inconsistent av availability and it really presented a threat to equity in, in, in how to make residency selections. Remember, many of us use these rotations as auditions and as an idea of what they're like. And so when you don't have them, you're losing a big uh, feeder stream to your selection process. And if some place does, but you don't, Thank God, the OBGYN community, and we're very fortunate as a community that our organizations, APCO, CREOG, ACOG, ABOG, SGO, SMFM, REI Society, AUGS, we are very interconnected. 
by design. We put each other on each other's boards. That's why all my conflicts are there because we're cross pollinating, so to speak. And that makes us very, very combined as a society. And so we agreed that as a, as an OBGYN society across America, we're not going to take any visiting students so that everybody has an even playing field. And we had outstanding buy-in with that. And we also agreed that we were going to do virtual um, um, interviews, again, across board. And it was important that everybody did it the same way. So the bottom line for UME, the students continued to learn, but just different type of learning. Many accelerated their attainment of the competencies that 21st century physicians need to master to meet the pandemic. I've certainly just doing Zoom lectures, and it's a very different lecture. I'm speaking to a computer. I know there are a bunch of bodies out there, but I can't tell if you're sleeping or awake. I know the honey badge is looking, but, but I can't tell. And so these are skill sets that are different. I rely on feedback. I'm not getting any. So you have to learn that. Um, Self-learning was much more efficient in this setting, especially if you follow it with some sort of group learning. And, and these are the things that we're, we're trying to do. You know what? Say what you want. The pandemic actually was a catalyst to modernize medical education and medical care. Think about how long ago we should have been doing telehealth. Man, we should have been doing telehealth years ago. This forced us to that. There's no question that there's some virtual learning and e-learning platforms that are good. Look, I don't think everything to be done virtually is good, but clearly we doing some of this was, uh, was an improvement. The medical school graduates today are going to be green. They're going to have less clinical experience, but they're going to have invaluable systems experience that are really going to be crucial to our health systems. We depend on lifelong learning and local mentorship to create physicians, and that is going to be our savior in this pandemic. There is a lot of overlap in our educational systems. You know, not too big a difference between a fourth year student and a first year intern, except rights that the first year intern can write an order because they have an MD. But the educational content and function are, they overlap a lot. Think about a fellow and a resident, lots of overlap there. Think about your new faculty. We now have, uh, during this pandemic, we decided to create a program for our faculty to onboard new faculty because we know they're going to need more mentoring, certainly at the beginning. And so th that is the bottom line for you and me that I think we'll be okay because we have so much overlap and that as educators that we need to know that these students that we're getting in July, they're smart, but they're green clinically. They're going to need a little bit more hands-on training at the beginning, but they're smart. They'll catch on. What about the effects on resident education or what I would call graduate medical education? And in this, I would throw in the fellows. You know, this is totally different than the students. In fact, it's 180 degrees opposite. Students were pulled out and put all virtual. The residents and fellows, very different. First of all, we learn clearly by hands-on clinical experience and teaching. When you cancel all elective cases and you cancel our educational venues, man, that really hits home when you're learning by clinical experience. And instead, so not only did you lose your elective cases, not only did you lose some educational time, but now, you know, I need you to work in the emergency room, triage, not on labor and delivery. Or I might need you to work in the ICU because we don't have enough bodies. Now, I did not get to that level here in Roanoke. I do know that programs in New York did. I don't know about the West Coast and I don't know what happened in, in Wisconsin, but I can tell you, that um, residents were at risk for being deployed to go elsewhere. You know, the other thing that happened to the residents, they're on the front line, they're at risk. I can't tell you the number of residents that were quarantined because of exposures. Remember one of the problems that we had is we didn't have effective testing to test for these exposures and let them come back into the workforce. So for the first several months of this pandemic, a resident that was exposed, they're out two weeks. That's crazy. And I had residents that were exposed multiple times and multiple weeks outages that they would not be able to work clinically in the hospital. Some actually got COVID, some were sick. And, and this was really, really challenging. On the wards, the direct patient contact was even limited because again, we're trying to be practical here. So instead of having a team go into a COVID patient room, why are we gonna expose all those people? So instead, 
we took the the, the necessary people. So uh, an attending and one resident, and sometimes it was only the attending that went in. And if it was a resident, it was usually the most senior one. So that meant the junior residents lost out on some education. So whether we like it or not, our clinical experience suffered. Certainly at the fellowship level, canceling elective cases in a fellowship that's time limited to only two years of clinical stuff, certainly the surgical ones, boy, that's really, really challenging uh, because I don't know if you can really make that up. So trainees, we had to teach them telehealth on the fly because we were learning it at the same time. I don't know if that's good or bad. To a certain degree, I think it was comforting to them to see us struggle with it just like they did. I just wish that I could protect them from struggling by saying, oh, I've been there and done that. Now I can tell them. But at the same time, we were lurking, working together. You know, they lost all their electives. Um, their procedures went down. Duty hour restrictions were still in effect. And I must say, here's why I'm going to move on to talking about what happened more at the national level. And so first, let's see what the ACGME responded. So they realized that this is serious and that we have a problem on our hands. And so they implemented three stages of uh, GME pandemic. You know, stage one was business as usual. Very few places actually kept on business as usual. Stage two, where there was an increase in clinical demand, some residents and fellows were shifted to patient care and some educational activities had to be suspended. I would say that's where we were. Initially, we suspended all, but then added them back. And now currently we're back to full, but as you are too, still virtual. And then there were some places in like New York that the stage three pandemic emergency status had a lot of implications because the residents were deployed to other places as were fellows and almost all their educational activities were lost. Okay, so let's talk about some data here. So this is an article of the impact of the 19 COVID-19 pandemic on surgical training. And it's surgical because that's the one that was published. I didn't have one on OBGYN, but I do have one uh, with that that uh, pertains to OBGYN as well. So just bear with me. So this was a 37 item survey distributed to essentially program leaders. They had a 21% response rate, which, you know, by, by um, standards is pretty good for a um, for a, 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 a plan such as this. So if you look at the distribution of the pandemic stages, most of them were in that stage two. That's where we were. Northeast was predominantly in stage three. So 30% of all our training programs were in stage three. And there were still about a quarter of them that were what we call stage one, which is not much different. But look at what happened to the impact of their training as you increase the stage of the pandemic. In other words, the stage being the higher level stage, the more the pandemic is, is reaping havoc in your uh, institution. So, you know, when you got to the stage three programs, 98% reduction in elective cases, even emerging cases went down. People were not coming to the emergency room. If you look at outpatient experience was down, inpatient hospital experience was down, outside rotations were down. There were more ICU rotations and the impact on didactics was obvious that the, the higher stage you were in the pandemic, the more it impacted you. Impact on learner being, learner well-being cannot be understated. Not only the physical state, the safety, but the physical health and emotional health. And I think that's the one that took the biggest hit. People were afraid. People were afraid of getting sick. People were afraid of their future. People were afraid of their education. People were afraid of patients. You know, the conclusion is, is the pandemically adversely impacted surgical training and well-being of all learners across the surgical specialties. And it was proportionally related to how severely the pandemic hit in your area. Look, I realized that's no rocket scientist. You could have probably figured out, but this is the data that we had. This is a different one. This is a different study. This is an American College of Surgeons um, committee survey. This one included 61 OBGYN programs that responded. 61, you know, for an ACS response, that's actually really good. You know, you figure you have a little over 200 programs in the country for 61 to respond to an American College of, survey, a College of Surgeons survey. I would say that's great. You know, 54% of those 61 programs 
uh, were aware that the institution had a disaster plan prior to COVID. Only about a, a third of the plans had a statement on how, what they're going to do with education during that disaster plan. And 83% of those OBGYN programs had significant reduction in elective cases. The range ranged from 75 to 100. And about three quarters said they had no change in emergent surgeries. You know, in OBGYN, I would understand that. Our emergencies are out of our control and out of patient controls, right? These are ectopics, accidents of pregnancies, um, and, and people were quarantining so we didn't see a difference in um, the OBGYN world. We did now. I mean, the effect of the pandemic on the birth rate has, has I mean, we're down 10% last year to this year. That's significant drop in, in, in deliveries. So it had downstream effect, but right in the midst of the pandemic, it didn't really affect you. So if you look at, I have to move my screen thing out of the way here. Uh, if you move, if you look at um, some how they affected people, this is that American College Surgeons data. It it looks like the medical students had the orange bar were sig significantly impacted. Remember, they were pulled out of out of training, so no surprise. The surgical trainees they were impacted, clearly impacted, not as much as the students. The faculty they did not have the same impact that the, because they're not learning. They are already, their impact is more on their finances and the ability to see patients. And if you look at the, what the, the programs, the adjustments that they made, you know, some of these are obvious. We shifted M and M to virtual, um, e exam preparation was unchanged. That was the same journal clubs went to virtual grand rounds, went to virtual. We got rid of visiting professionalships by and large. Now they've come back in the virtual world. Tour boards at first were canceled and then went back to virtual very quickly. Research conferences became virtual. You know, simulation training, eh, most of them were suspended because that was still an in-person event. We're now trying to figure out how to do virtual simulation. It's kind of like an oxymoron or a, a double entendre there, but that's what we're doing. And in-person teaching rounds, you know, obviously went, went, went down, but those still had to occur just with limited numbers. So what did we do to address these educational needs? You know, we started recording some of our lectures so people can, can look at them on their own time. Obviously the virtual conferences that I talked about, you know, I did virtual mentorship. I'm still doing it actually. Um, people on my faculty, that I meet with regularly to mentor them, to help them hone their leadership skills instead of doing it in person, which is way more fun and I think way more affected. I now do it over the phone or by Zoom because it's just more practical. You know, virtual oral exams, virtual interviewing. Obviously, we had a very successful virtual interview season, I believe. I guess we'll really know in July when these uh, folks start and see how it turns out. Um, the, the purple bar there, telemedicine, clearly that's something that was different and changed and, and, and that we did because we needed to. So what you're seeing are some educational themes that are coming up. There's a potential impact on promotion or graduation. Well, that affected maybe about two to 5%. So there were some programs that said, I can't graduate my chief resident because they just didn't have enough. Thank God it was few. Um, OBGYN as a group was the one that was the least affected with only 2% of the program saying that they had to delay graduation for their, uh, their chiefs. You know, the impact on emotional health was way bigger than the impact on their physical health. And what that taught us is that wellness became even more important. And I, as a chair, started to focus more and more on this. It's challenging because it's not easy to do. Engage in crisis communication and active change leadership. What the heck is that? I can tell you, this was the biggest learning experience in my life because as a leader, I had to come out to the department and try and just keep peace and add calmness and support and empathy. And we had to do this as the rules are changing on the fly. Like I said, I'd come out in the morning, this is our plan. And in the afternoon, no, that's no longer our plan because we ran out of this PPE. Now we have to do this. 
So that was what I call active change leadership. You're trying to lead a group when the rules are changing constantly. And it makes you look like you don't know what you're doing. And it creates a lot of uncertainty. And that really, really challenges leaders to try and keep just sanity in, in, in the masses. We opened command centers, you know, or in places did huddles. It's essentially that to come up with a master plan. I can tell you that we had daily meetings, multiple meetings a day to try and disseminate the information in a way that was uniform and everybody got the same message. Um, remember, it was really important as a chair that I gave them the truth, accurate information. It was really, really important that I could not give them any information that was not accurate or if I didn't know the validity of it, I would tell them that. And I would try and avoid putting that out there because rather than confuse them, I, I, I'd rather try and just give them what I know. You know, a lot of what I did was really acknowledge the uncertainty and try and express concern about their well being. I checked in with people regularly. I biggie sized my wellness program, and I have a director of wellness that I gave more dedicated time. Remember, during the pandemic, I had time to give, there weren't any clinics. So I gave her more dedicated time to form a task force to go out and work not only with the faculty, but our other providers, the, the nurse practitioners, the midwives, the residents, and the staff, because we needed to demonstrate a commitment to their well being. And this is how we did it in our department. You know, our professional organizations and accrediting bodies and licensing boards, they all made accommodations. The LCME basically said, that's what the group that governs medical schools said, they're going to allow changes in instructional methods as long as you can still evaluate them by competency standards. Uh, they basically gave the medical school deans the power. That's my last bullet there. That is really important because instead of telling programs what to do, they realized that this was very, very different from organization to organization. And so they really empowered the deans to make decisions. That was a smart move. Going back to my second bullet, they allowed for uh, changes in instructional methods as long as we kept our standards. Some of the state governments used regular story statutes to enable early graduation, like New York did, because they needed more people in the workforce. That was their local need. We didn't have that need here. ABOG or ABMS and ACGME, my hat's off to them. Actually, they understood the, the unique situation that was brought on by the pandemic that, and that it required flexibility, creativity, and understanding in order to maintain the organization's shared commitment to the public and ensure that physician practice standards that were safe and efficacious. You know, they really endorsed and relied on local authority. They said, look, rather than ACGME tell you what's okay, they put more power on the competency committees at your local departments and training program directors to determine readiness rather than use local, local uh, national standards. And so they help the program directors and the competency committees assess trainees readiness by focusing them on milestone data looking at and trustable professional activities that everybody needs to do and used other data such as in training exams and a case procedure logs. So basically multi source feedback and they showed us that, you know, we do have data. It's maybe not all the data that we used to or what we like, but there is data and we should be able to make changes with that. And we, we did. So. Our educational response to this, we switched to the virtual platforms, Zoom, WebEx, Team, BlueJeans. I know what that is actually, um, I know I haven't worked on it. And even which some places moved to social media platforms. I did not have to do this because we just decided that we're gonna keep everything internal, but there were programs that used platforms like Instagram and Twitter to get information out quickly. Remember, when you change a plan, Many times in the beginning of this pandemic, those effects were immediate. And so I needed to get that information out right away, not tomorrow or the next day. And so sometimes platforms such as Instagram and Twitter were the best platforms to do that. We did not have to resort that here. Obviously, I already mentioned that we moved a lot of things to virtual activities, um, including the research meetings 
and all our department meetings now became uh, virtual. What about COVID-19 and research? I think this hurt the fellowships more than the residents. Um, although it hurt the residents as well, because yeah, the really high end tier one studies that have direct health benefits to the participants, those continued. But most of the research that's done in residency programs, as far as resident projects, those kind of programs were, were came to a screeching halt. Even some of the fellow projects came to a halt and they have very limited time in their fellowship to do this. So this really um, became a problem. At, at, at the board level, we were way more um, understanding and gave a lot of leeway into what can be done, not as a result of, but probably happening in accordance with the board even loosened or opened up its criteria for what type of projects are allowed to uh, do for fellowship certification. But there's no question that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had a huge impact on research. We are way behind and have not uh, and have not caught up with that. You know, interestingly, attendance at conferences actually went up. Uh, interesting that people actually are able to attend these meetings. You know, in our department, instead of having our, our monthly department meeting at 615 in the evening, we now have our monthly department meeting at lunchtime from 12 to 1. We're able to get it all in in that hour. At before 615 would go to 730, 745, and that's crazy. People are not happy with that. So actually, our conferences are better attended and more popular now that they're virtual. Um, you know, recreating conference time into virtual is time consuming. Yes, initially we just said, okay, I'll give this PowerPoint virtual. But what you realize is the PowerPoint that you used to give live, when you give that same PowerPoint virtual with no changes, doesn't have the same punch. You need to grab your audience more. And so it was time consuming. You had to adjust your lectures to work with the virtual platform. You know, the other thing that we've really uh, realized is, you know, to me, internet is like air and water. That's a given, right? No, it's not. Certainly in, in Southwest Virginia, it's not. Not everybody has stable connections. And so even though these platforms would work great on stable pl and internet platforms, that's not what we have. That interaction with, with the audience is lost. It's very, very hard. So it's hard for me to identify if you guys are getting this, are you bored by this, if there's any gaps or if people have questions. Sometimes I can look at you and say, do you have a question? And then you come up with a wonderful question because there's really less feedback. You know, the reality is that some of our faculty, and I'll throw myself into this, are less savvy. At least today, I was able to share my screen and then I hope to be able to unshare it at the end because I've done this enough. But you know, that's a learning curve. And there are other nuances with, with with these virtual platforms. So for example, one of the things that I didn't do today is I didn't show you any videos. And the reason is, is because it is more challenging to get my video to work on this platform because everything I did to get it to work today, I have to do more and I have to activate my audio and make sure that my firewalls will allow video. And let me tell you the issues that, that we came up because of firewalls were incredible. So you know what the bottom line is? We faculty need more faculty development on how to create pandemic lectures and how to work on pandemic platforms and get over it. We do, we will benefit from it. I'm actively looking for experts. And if you know of any, send them my way uh, because we need more help with this. So our greatest challenge is the suboptimal replication of patient encounters and company-based acceptance of the learners. It's just not the same when you're not doing it in purpose, uh, in, in, in person. You know, we have other challenges now. And I think we all suffer with this. The, the, the line between work and life and home is very blurred now because so this past week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're giving oral exams virtually. I was at home. Let me tell you, it's the most stressful three days of my life now because there was no balance. I was always working, even when I wasn't working. And, and, and if you look at what the effect of the pandemic has had on my schedule, it's terrible. I come home and the first question my kids ask me is, hey, are you going to be here for dinner or you have more calls? I always have more calls. I, I have scheduled meetings that occur regularly at 6, 637. That was not the case before, but the pandemic has forced that. That's a challenge and we need to create barriers so that we can really try and separate work and home life. We need to do that or we're going to burn out. 
Um, the added responsibilities. Oh, great. You're working from home. Well, you know what? Guess what? Your kids, they're not going to school. So yes, you're working from home, but you know what? You're doing two jobs because you're working from home and you got to take care of your kids. And I can't tell you the number of stories that you've heard that I've listened to and, and, and that have happened to all of us on virtual working from home platforms when you have young kids involved and pets and stuff like that. You know, the household chores present new obstacles for those working from home because, oh, I'm home. Yeah, but you know, I got to work, but you know, you got to do your chores and normally you did them either before work or after work and you're trying to do them during work and it's not working. You know, the social isolation that the pandemic brings, I can't tell you, I haven't been out to dinner in a year. Uh, I've ordered takeout, but not out to dinner. This impacts us psychologically with more stress and less ability to de-stress. It leads to more anxiety, more depression, and it really hits our wellness really right at the core. There's a lot of fear about contracting COVID. Now that we're getting vaccinated, thank God that part of it is going away. But I can tell you that at the beginning, when I would go see my grandson, and you'll see a picture of at the end, I was really careful to stay inside his bubble. But if I came from work, they would make me strip in the garage. And like my clothes had cooties on it. And, you know, and before I came in the house, because people were afraid, people were afraid, the healthcare workers of bringing it to their own families. So what this led to was provider burnout like we've never seen before. And that's really been an issue for us. How about on medical, continuing medical education? That's us. You know, we stopped all our in-person meetings. You know, this adversely impacts our ability to network and the delivery of new information because we learn new information from our friends and from going to lectures. Yes, you can learn it from a virtual platform, but you, what you lose out is the, the back and forth. Well, I like this. and What do you think? And listen to what this one says and you lose that. So when you cancel our meetings, the, the, the delivery of information on the platform is just more limited. We have more limited attention spans. You know, there was one good thing is for this past year, most CME was free for whatever it's worth. But this became a problem for all our societies. I can tell you that all our subspecialty societies from ACOG to SGO to MFM, all of them, they depend on meetings for revenue. And they depend on the camaraderie and the networking to promote the society. And this is how we impact our, our, our patient care. And we lost that. Um, Many of our societies are dealing with very difficult financial portfolios right now and are having to make very, very difficult changes like, um, like let go of staff, cut some member services, uh, uh, programs that we would participate in that we can't do anymore because we just can't afford it. So it's hit CME, continuing medical education, really, really hard. You know, like I said, ABOG's been very accommodating. We canceled the 2020 subspecialty exam because it's just impossible. You know, we were fortunate to complete the both the specialty and subspecialty written exams in uh, mid-July, unlike the American Board of Surgery, who had a huge meltdown and their exam was canceled, their written exam was canceled on the day because they couldn't deliver it. We were so fortunate that we thought ahead, spaced it out enough, so that, remember, these testing centers, they're doing the testing for all disciplines, not just OBGYN. And that only made the virtual part and the need for testing centers greater, but the testing centers couldn't handle the volume because they had to socially distance. So there were so many factors here. And then we moved our, 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 our oral uh, exams to a uh, written platform for the, the general OBGYN board. So this um, February, the oral exams for the general OBGYNs that were supposed to be given November, December, and January, and in February, became a written exam for one time and one time only this year. Um, we then moved the subspecialty orals that was canceled the year before. This is a big deal because people, depending on where they are on their clock, you know, you have eight years after you finish your training to get uh, certified. If you don't, you got to start all over. So if you're in year seven and you cancel the board exam, that's a big deal. ABOG was very accommodating. And thank God that we were able to shift it to a virtual platform that we completed this week. And we were able to examine all the candidates that signed up. Amen. That was a big deal. What can we do as leaders? 
you know, I think it's still important to do clear and frequent communication. This was certainly paramount in the pandemic and, and, and I've continued that. So I have uh, regular meetings with my section heads more so than before, all virtual, but every single week where before it was quarterly and monthly, now it's weekly. And if there's nothing to talk about, we'll cancel it. Everybody gets time back. But I find that incredibly helpful. I'm way more communicated and way more connected to my section heads and my divisions than I was before. You know, as leaders, you need a lot of empathy, a lot of empathy. Did I say a lot? Because you really do need a lot. Um, you got to pay attention. Faculty residents are burning out. You got to watch for their well-being. Um, I've never had this many people come to me and say, I need to talk to you because I'm burned out. People would want to talk to me, but they wouldn't say burned out. Now that's the reason for the meeting. So it's important. Now is the time to import it, to, to emphasize the provider wellness and be delivered about it. Faculty development on, on virtual education and resources, as I mentioned before, that's something that we can do. And that's something that we need to do. And again, as a leader, as much as you can listen, 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 rather than try and explain or defend because you, re you really just need to listen. That's what your workforce needs you to do. Then you can process and then come out and, and, and say something later. But listening is very, very important here. Even if you disagree, your folks need to be heard and being heard is very important during these times. So in conclusion, and I'm done, you know, our medical education is never gonna be the same. We jumped into the 21st century with telehealth and, and, and tele, medicine and virtual platforms. And it's really forced us to reassess our programs and our programs will be better because we're gonna have more options, more opportunities. We're in the 21st century, finally. You know, this is a great opportunity to put for, push forth innovation. It really is prime right now. We're looking for all things that can help. And, and this is an opportunity. We have learned to leverage technology and we need to continue to leverage technology for education and clinical benefit. We realize that it's forced my department to get my, my whole thing is I don't have my phone because I'm giving a talk, but I want more um, a department to connect with our patients with apps and more virtual connections because that's what the patients want. Um, you know, remember our newer graduates at any level from student to resident, resident to fellow, fellow to faculty, they're gonna be a little bit more green, but they're smart folks. We, 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 in our pipeline, we have really gifted individuals. And so they can overcome this. They're just gonna need a little bit more mentoring at the beginning and they really should come out okay. As our leaders, we need to know that this is our job, that July and August more than ever, you need to pay attention and Keep more hands on than hands off because it'll pay dividends downstream for you. Don't be afraid of this. Think about all the things that we learned after fellowship. Let's talk about myself. I can remember in fellowship talking to Butch Fowler, who was my program director, saying, what about those crazy people in Arizona doing laparoscopic nodes? Could you believe that? We're never going to do that. Now look at me. You know, I learned that all outside of fellowship. What about, you're going to laugh at this one, vaginal probe ultrasound. Maybe I graduated in 1990 from residency and 92 from fellowship. That was on the, right at the beginning of that. I never learned how to do vaginal probe ultrasound. I learned that later, you know. Um, sentinel node biopsies. That's something I learned later. Robotics. I learned that well into my adult life. So we have to get over the fact that they're not coming with as much clinical skills as they used to because our system is designed with overlap and our system is designed to be able to teach them just like we did. We are highly skilled. We are very, very connected. And as a society, we are very supportive of each other. And I think OBGYN as a society, because of the net that our societies have that are interconnected, we'll get through this and come out on the, on the good end. Martin Luther King um, had said, as my suffering mounted, I soon realized that there were two ways in which I could respond to my situation, either to react with bitterness or seek to transform the suffering into a creative force. I decided to do the follow. I decided to follow the latter course. I wish he was still with us. We can use leadership like this in our society today. Um, and that's what we need to do is make this, we need to learn how to make something out of nothing. And we can do that. Um, 
that's it. This is my new pride and joy. This is my my COVID baby. This is my first grandson. Miller is his name. And let me tell you something. I busted my butt to make sure that I never broke that bubble. I was paranoid as can be. I don't go out for anything. People come to the door, leave it at the footstep because I always want to make sure I can see Miller. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, see if I can do this. Fidel, thank you. That summary somehow brought me, brings me solace. And it's a little weird because reflecting back, one could just like want to boo hoo. But thank you. That was really amazing. And I'm going to let other folks ask questions. I do have one, but I want to give people a chance. Well, actually, before they start, I'll just say, you know, one thing I'm worried about is this thing about being able to learn how to lead teams for educate, you know, for the trainees. You know, it's been so weird, like, you know, like learning how to work directly with people. That's going to, you know, it's going to be the way it is, as you've summarized. But I think it's, I think we're all going to have to be very forgiving of the people that are coming up the ladder right now. We, we we do and and rather than forgiving Laurel, look, we we're smart. That's the beauty of our system is that we have smart people in the pipeline, and if you have smart people, you can teach them anything. You just have to be deliberate with it. So, July and August different than look in July and August. I am in town most of the time because I know as a leader that we got new people on board. This is when most of my accidents are going to happen. Most of my mistakes are going to happen. Be be aware of that, especially during the pandemic. So I want folks to be even more deliberate right now when you're taking on new folks to make sure that you oversee and provide them oversight and training and and help we can do this we really can all right we're, i'm going to open it up kids what do you got for this guy is everybody else feeling soothed a little bit just reviewing the landscape uh people are being shy come on now you have some outstanding educators there I know it's an amazing department. I love my people. You do. Dr. You have a great department. Dr. Valet, it's Ryan Spencer. Thanks for your talk. And I just wanted to ask you a question as uh, someone directly associated with a lot of types of trainees. As um, as we work through an, a, an emergence from the pandemic, or maybe return to some things we used to do, integrating newer principles. I'm just wondering how you see those challenges and what, as an educational leader, uh, one could do to try to incorporate new principles and trying to reincorporate the old ones that we really loved and worked well that we've had to sort of um, let stand by for the time being. So, you know, go ahead. I, I would say that this is a time that as a leader, rather than dictate, I need to listen. I need to, because honestly, we have a lot of people in the workforce that are right there in the trenches that you're talking about. And I'm sitting here a little bit in the ivory tower as the chair. I'm not as clinically active as the people that are doing this every day. And so for me, my challenges are very different than yours, Ryan. And I would say, I would say this is where you get a group of people together to listen and try and pick the best of both worlds. What can you learn from the, the virtual and what of the virtual do you like to bring into the future? And what of the in-person do you find necessary and like and want to bring that into the future? We're going to get out of this pandemic and we're going to go back to restaurants and we're going to where I don't know if I'll ever fly again without a mask, but that's me. But but but, you know, we're going to get back to a more normal state. And the beauty, Ryan, is that we'll have two pots to pick from the virtual pot and the in-person pot where before everything was done in person. So this is an opportunity yeah. for growth. It really is. It's Del. That is a very good point. Even I, the techno ignoramus person I am, have stepped up. Now, listen, one thing this department's done a great job at under David Kushner's leadership is to focus on uh, wellness. Yes. And so, you know, we're going to cut off now because people got to get at it. And I'm sure you've got to get at it yourself. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's 10 o'clock. And I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. My friends, hello, and thanks for everything. Thank you for the invitation.